Welcome. We appreciate you joining with us to watch this message. We pray it will bless you, that we'll all learn, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in in watching the message at this time. Welcome to a little bit different format this time. Our live stream went down this past Sunday, and so we're redoing the message in a little bit different location and format. With the temperatures warming up, summer's on the way. Once again, the pesky flies are out, starting to bother us and cause problems with our, with our picnics and so forth. Did you ever wonder why God created the fly? Well, we have to assume that even before the fall of mankind, that there was animal wastes. And the fly was probably needed as part of the system to clean that waste up. And of course, at that point, there wouldn't have been diseases or anything. So we can assume the fly had a good purpose back then as it has now. Uh, scientists tell us, especially British scientists tell us, that flies have some of the most unique abilities of any creature in their flying capabilities. Such as these scientists tell us that a house fly can make six turns in one second. They can hover, they can fly straight up, they can fly straight down, they can fly backwards, they can even do somersaults and land on ceiling or many other surfaces of any direction. Plus they can perform a whole host of other maneuverabilities uh, in their flying process. Flies are loaded with sensors. They have compound eyes that permit panoramic imagery, and they have superb motion detection. They have wind-sensitive hairs and antennae. They also have three light sensors on top of their head to help give them a direction to know which way is up. Scientists tell us that roughly two-thirds of a fly's entire nervous system is devoted to processing visual images. Now, we understand why it's so difficult to try to swat a fly in the air or even swat it once it's landed. They are designed to be professional escape artists. Evidently, God put a lot into a fly when he developed the fly. Just think how much God put into the rest of the world and you and me in developing us and creating us. Well, welcome to week two of our new sermon series, Beginnings, which is a sermon series within the larger sermon series of the epic journey where we're working our way through the Bible. And in this beginning series, we are at the very beginning of Genesis, learning about the creation and Adam and Eve and so forth, the things that happen in the first several chapters of Genesis. Last week, we talked about naturalism. Naturalism is, well, it's a religion. Uh, they consider it a science, but not really. It's more of a religion. It's a, it's a religion that believes that the universe was uh, evolved over billions of years. These people tell us that we have developed over millions of years. The evolutionists is what they are. Naturalism's God is theoretical science. In other words, naturalist science believe that there's always a physical cause and a physical effect. But these naturalists believe that they're, they really can't nail down exactly what they're telling us. They're, they're a bunch of theories, speculations, and wishful thinking. Naturalism's hero is time. If they can't explain something that took place within thousands of years, they just add more thousands or maybe millions of years. If they can't explain it in millions of years, they add more millions or maybe billions of years. Now, in contrast to naturalism is Christianity, that we believe that God created everything that is. And so today we're looking at the six days of creation. And we're asking a question. Did God create in six 24-hour days? Well, let's start with when do we believe that God created the universe? 
Well, according to the Bible, and we look at the genealogies in Genesis, it would appear that God created the universe around 4000 BC. Now, some people argue that it probably is maybe a little bit older than that. They say, well, maybe the writer of Genesis skipped a few generations, which is unlikely because they give us the times and years of birth of the generations. But let's say that maybe they did skip a couple generations in there. Uh, the genealogy of Jesus is not a precise genealogy. There's generations skipped. So scholars think that at the most oldest age of the earth might be 8 to 10,000 BC. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and start reading. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, we could spend a lot of time on just these two verses. The Bible starts off by assuming that we know God. Well, we believe that, Gen that Moses probably wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. So by the time that Moses wrote the book of Genesis, people would have known who God is. So the assumption of God is there. God was before time, though. God existed before time began. He exists in time. And one of these days when Jesus returns, we will all exist outside of time. But this verse says that God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that pretty much sums up these early chapters of Genesis. God made everything that is, and he made it from nothing. We read from Hebrews last week, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, that God created everything out of nothing. But then verse 2 tells us a little bit more about God. We go to the end of the verse, we learn that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This is the third person of God, the Holy Spirit. And from the New Testament, we learn also that not only was God and the Holy Spirit at the beginning, but so was Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Genesis begins with the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The entire Godhead was at the very beginning of creation. So let's return to verse 2 where it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. This describes the condition of the earth. Formless empty, and total darkness. Now, when it says darkness was over the surface of the deep, usually in the Old Testament Hebrew writing, that means the depth of the oceans or the depth of the seas. We'll discuss this a little bit more when we get to day two of the creation. But for right now, let's just understand that water enclosed the surface of the earth. Let's go to verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now we're going to spend a little bit more time on day one so that we can explain some things that will basically carry throughout the Genesis creation narrative here. We need to take special notice here of how light came into existence. God spoke it into existence. God spoke everything into existence. That is Creation came about at God's command. God spoke and it came to be. So in every case, except for the last part of his creation, God spoke the entire universe and creation into existence. He spoke all the planets, all the stars, and the earth and all of creation into existence. 
Let's continue with verse 4. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus, on day one, God created light. God spoke light into existence. But note, this was not the sun, the moon, or the stars. This was light. Where did the light come from? Well, scholars assume that this was the glory of God, the radiating light of God. And the way it sounds, when there was no darkness at the beginning, he created light. There was no shadows because God's glory, his light was everywhere. But then he did separate the light from the darkness. And at the end of the day, God looked back on his creation of light and he saw that it was good. Now, we go to verse 5, and the last part says, And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Now, what we need to understand here is that in the Hebrew uh, ancient culture, their day began at evening, at dusk. So, our day begins with midnight, and goes to, or the stroke of midnight, goes around 24 hours, what they consider their day to start as in the evening. So their Saturday, say for instance, would start Friday evening and go to Saturday evening. Then at Saturday evening, their Sunday would start. That would be their first day of the week. So God made certain on this very first day of creation that he is talking 24-hour days. We're not talking eons of time. We're talking specific 24-hour days. So God heads this theory of evolution off right off the bat. Not eons of time. This isn't six segments of vast amounts of time that God is talking about here for the creation. He is talking six 24-hour days of the creation. And thus time began on day one. Go to verse 6. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. So on day two, God created sky. But note once again, God spoke and at his command, he separated the waters from the earth from the waters above the earth. Does this mean there was no gravity when day two began? We don't really know. What consistency was this water on the earth? Was it maybe less condensed as what it is now? In other words, water in a glass, if we pour it out onto the floor, it goes down and splatters all over the place. Well, was this a different gravitational pull that water was a different consistency? Maybe not quite a, a vapor like the cloud, but maybe not the form that we know it as what is in the lakes and the seas. And maybe, maybe with less gravitational pull, it was uh, less gravitational pull that the water was maybe uh, not thick enough for fish to live in, but yet too thick for us to breathe. Uh, we don't know, but. On day two, when God created the sky, he made sure that the water went down to the earth solidly and the, then the clouds, the, the sky formed. And so he separated the two waters in some way. One thing that's amazing, the scholars note though, at the end of day two, every other day of the creation, God ends by saying, and he saw that it was good. This did not happen at the end of day two. We don't know what it means. We just take a notice of it. But he does say that this was the second 24-hour day, an evening and a morning, the end of day two then. Verse 9. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, 
and gathered the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit and seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. God spoke once again and separated the waters on the earth. So on day three, God created the seas, the ground, and the vegetation. At God's command, the seas formed and the dry ground appeared. Now, another miracle is how quickly this dry, dry ground was ready to plant. Farmers right now are waiting for the ground to dry out so they can get into the fields. Over the winter time, the ground becomes saturated and it takes the sun and the wind to dry the ground out. Now, now we don't want the rain to stop. That causes a drought. We just need the rain to slow down so farmers and gardeners can get onto the soil. But on day three, God brought the dry ground up out of the bottom of the ocean, we might say, and then that ground was ready to plant on the same day. Dried it out, ready to go. Now notice, when God created these, this vegetation on the earth, he told them to reproduce according to their kinds. Now, right here is another statement debunking evolution. God did not create plants to develop into different kind of plants. God addressed the theory of evolution right off the bat. Vegetation was to produce, reproduce after its own kind. And just like at the end of day one, God saw that it was good. Verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times, the days and years. And let, the, there, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. So on day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. God spoke, and these celestial lights came into being. This despite that God already created light on day one. Now he made these bodies of light and hung these lights in the sky. But now let's stop and think about this just a little bit. You know, as Christians, it's easy for us to think that or to understand that Jesus uh, turned water into wine. It's, we've read that enough times, we just kind of come to accept it. We also come to understand that Jesus could make a blind person able to see or a lame person able to walk. Even raise a girl from the dead. And Jesus came back from the dead. But for some reason it seems difficult to us to believe or understand that God hung all these celestial bodies in the skies. Scientists tell us, uh, they estimate I should say, that our galaxy, the Milky Way, has around 100 to 400 billion stars in, the, in our galaxy. Scientists estimate that there are between 100 and 200 billion galaxies. Now think about this. That's an unbelievable number and amount of galaxies and scientists still cannot see to the edge of the universe. Yet God made them all on day four. And at the end of the day, he saw that they were good.
verse 20. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth, across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living thing with which the water teems, and that moves about in it, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. So on day five, God created the fish and the birds. Once again, God spoke and at his command, the fish and the birds of all kinds came about. In the water, the fish came about. In the sky, the birds came about. And notice that once again, God debunks evolution. In verse 20, God told the water creatures and the birds to increase in number, to fill the skies. Now, if evolution had already taken place, or been in the process of taking place, the seas would have already been filled with some sorts of creatures. And there would have been all kinds of creatures on the ground or being able to start to fly. This wasn't the case. God debunked evolution in the narrative of this creation. There was and is no evolution. God told the fish and the birds to multiply and fill the waters of the earth. Verse 24. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over the, all the creatures that move along the ground. So on day six, God created the land animals and mankind. Now, one last time, God spoke and at his command, all the land animals came to being. Plus, he then created Adam and Eve. Genesis specifically states that God made all the different animals according to their kinds. See, God leaves no room whatsoever for the theory of evolution. God knew that people would scoff someday at his creation, saying, oh, there is no God, or oh, there could be no creation such as what Christians believe. But God was prepared for the scoffers. God specifically states in this creation narrative, animals and birds and plants and everything after their own kind, and did it in 24-hour days, not eons or millions or billions of years. And then to top this all off, of all of his creation, he created mankind, male and female, Adam and Eve. And we're going to address more of this next week in our Mother's Day message, so be sure to join us for that. As, then, as with all the sea creatures and the birds of the air, God told the animals to reproduce after their own kind. No room whatsoever for evolution. And God saw that all of this was good. And then God made man in his image. Now notice, God did not speak Adam and Eve into existence. Rather, the Bible knows a little, notes a little bit different phrase here. We go back to verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. God included the Trinity Godhead into making a man. He says, let us. And he said, in our image, in our likeness. 
God gave more attention to Adam and Eve than all the other creation. Adam and Eve are special. You are special. Even though God didn't create you or form you out of the dust of the ground as he did with Adam and Eve, he created you in your mother's womb. And he created you special. And God instructed every living creature to eat the vegetation that he created on day three. There was no uh, gone to uh, a, a hog roast or gone to a chicken barbecue or we didn't go to baseball games and eat hot dogs because at that point, no animals, neither mankind, no one ate animal food. It was all vegetation until after the flood and Noah's Ark, which we'll get to that in this series also. But at this point, animals did not eat animals, and people did not eat animals either. They ate the vegetation that God created on day three. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. Notice, once again, complete. No, no chance of this theory of evolution. God created it six 24-hour days, and it was all good. God saw that everything in it was as it should be, and God was prepared for those who would want to scorn him. No evolution. Verse 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So at the end of day six, God rested. Day seven, therefore, is rest. Now, this is not because God was worn out from his work and he needed to rest. Rather, I believe that he wanted to just admire what he had done. Same way as when you and I do something. Maybe we mowed the yard and it looks beautiful. We want to turn around and take a look at it. Or we, we plant a field of corn or we work the garden or, or we bake a cake or whatever it might be. And when we get all done, we just kind of like to look at it and we're pleased with it. That was God looking back on his creation. Now, God has given us a vast array of creatures that he created and through this message we really didn't stop and and talk about any of those creatures so let's just name a few of them right now to understand how wonderfully different he made everything the archer fish this fish from underwater is able to squirt a stream of water up to five feet of accuracy outside of the water above the water and knock insects into the water so that the fish can eat it. Now, another aspect of this is that if you and I are underwater, uh, and I don't understand this completely, but the water uh, breaks the light rays so that what we think is maybe this point right here isn't actually at that point because of the difference of the water surface. But this fish, somehow God created the fish in such a way that its brain can make up for that light refraction if that's the right word and still hit that insect it's an amazing ability that this fish has plus also the seahorse now i am so thankful that i am not a male seahorse uh, because from what i learned the seahorse the female seahorse actually impregnates the male seahorse with her eggs and then the male seahorse incubates these eggs hatches them inside his body and then goes into labor to deliver these baby seahorses thank you god i'm not a seahorse then there's the hermit crab now we're all familiar with the hermit crab but when you take a look at the uniqueness of what it does it's it's able to move from one shell to another shell never harming the creature that's in the shell that animal because it, it only inhabits empty shells and it's specially designed legs that enable it to clasp onto the shell inside, but yet still move and walk around. It's a wonderful design by God. Then there's the albatross. 
The albatross we might consider a, an overgrown huge seagull. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, bird on the planet. And a young albatross can soar up to three times around the earth and never land, just soaring on the wind curtain, currents, able to eat and drink while on the fly. Then there's the red, red cock woodpecker. The red cock woodpecker pecks so fast with his beak, it hits the trunk at eight times per second at a force upwards of 500 foot-pounds per strike. Now, that's like you, not me. That's like you running into a tree at 13 mile, mile an hour and do it 13, uh, excuse me, eight times with each second. I don't want to do that. That's a lot of pain. But just think that God is able to make, he made that woodpecker's brain to absorb that kind of an impact eight times times per second at 500 foot-pounds. And then there's a migration of birds. Scientists have hatched and raised birds in total captivity, never been in the wild. Then they've banded and released those birds into the wild. Now I'm assuming not around any other birds of the like kinds. And those birds knew when it was time to migrate and knew where to migrate all designed by God. Not learned behavior from other birds, no evolution, just created by God, intelligent design. You might ask, well, what about the dinosaurs? Well, we're not going to talk about those this time, but we will address those in this beginnings series. One other issue I said I was going to address, and I may have to put it off just a, another week or two, I said that either this week or this next Sunday, I would explain why you cannot be a Christian and believe in the theory of evolution. It's impossible. Well, I'll address that either the next week or the following week, and the reason I say possibly the following week is because we've added another message in this beginnings series. So let's go back to the title of this message. How did you answer the question? Did God create in six 24-hour days? What's your answer? What do you think? We're not done talking about the creation yet. We've got a little way to go, so come back and join us for more. Father in heaven, thank you so much for who you are. The design of the earth, the plants, the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, the birds, the fish, all the land animals, and mankind. Father, when we, when we stop and just take a look at your creation, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you, Father, for caring so much. Thank you for creating us, mankind, each of us so wonderfully individual, but yet in harmony with you and each other. Guide us and lead us, Father, to, to not get led astray with his theories of mankind's ideas of evolution. Help us to stay on the straight and narrow and believe what your word, your Bible, tells us. And thank you for Jesus, who saves us from our sins. We love you. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website at roscoffchurch.org. You can find the information there, how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you, talk with you, and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.